In addition to wearing many, many other pretty hats, Jennifer Ann Gordon is a multi-award winning dark fiction horror author. Pretty Ugly, our featured book today, won the Helicon Award for Best Horror 2022. Stay tuned for today's episode of the Writer's Corner live show. Don't go away. We'll be right back. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Writer's Corner live show. I'm your host, Bridgette Limbanda from Cape Town in South Africa. And in today's show, we're going to be welcome an amazing author, Jennifer Ann Gordon. If this is your first time watching the show, we've been going live for over four and a half years. Uh, we'd love to give you a shout out. So just let us know in the comments. This live stream is brought to you. Compliments of Creative Edge, StreamYard and Be Life Media. So whether you're watching us over on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, Amazon Live, a hearty warm welcome. And if you're catching the replay, a hearty warm welcome to you too. Now, one of the things that we're very, very passionate about is helping authors level up. Thanks to the pandemic, you're no longer limited to going down to the library or your local school to talk about your book. You can now hop online and talk about your book, not just to people where you live locally, but globally. Isn't that just amazing? It's just opened up wonderful doors for authors. But we'd like to share one or two quick tips before we bring our amazing author on the show to join us here. So many of you may talk about your book when you hop onto TikTok or Instagram. And when you do that, you'll be, you'll be holding your phone in portrait mode. And that'd be 100% correct because it will use the entire screen real estate when you're on TikTok and when you're on Instagram. But here's a tip. If you are going live on Facebook, on YouTube, or any of the other platforms, you want to turn your phone the other way around. And that's called landscape mode. And if you ever wondered why you're going live on Facebook and you get those black lines on the sides, well, that's why, and that'll fix it. What you also want to do is ensure that you put your phone onto a tripod. Now, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there are like a gazillion different tripods. You can literally take your pick, um, but do put your phone on a tripod because it's impossible for you to talk about your book, be animated, pay attention to your audience, and hold your phone still. That's impossible. But if you're traveling and you're talking about your book, here's a quick hack. Take your phone, take some sticky tape, press stick, tic tac, whatever it is, and just stick your phone onto the nearest window. The great thing about that is that you're going to have your phone at the correct 90 degree angle, plus you're going to have front facing light so your audience can see you while you're talking about your book because that's exactly what you want. Now, if you want, one level up just a little bit from there, you can invest in any kind of lavalier microphone. And I can tell you there are a gazillion of them. Just take your pick. There are different brands, different makes. But these lavalier microphones, they're not expensive. They're very cheap, but they'll make a huge difference. If, however, you are on your um, on, on a laptop or a computer and you want to level on there, invest in a webcam. Anything in the Logitech range, I've tried all of them as I've grown up with Logitech. And me and I are both using Brio, which has got right side light technology, which means it'll you don't have to be a lighting fundi. It'll just automatically adjust your lighting conditions. And that's wonderful. And now let me welcome my amazing co-host and friend, Mary Elizabeth Jackson. Um, and after that, we're going to welcome Jennifer Ann Gordon. Mary is a special needs and disabilities advocate. She's a educational speaker, a pastor, ghostwriter, and an award-winning author herself. And go check out her latest book, um, Cheers from Heaven. Mary, how are you today? I am great. And as you can see by the clothing we have on, right, we're going into winter and you're going into summer because we have our first cold snap and it's freezing. 
Oh my goodness, isn't it just crazy how we live in different parts of the world? And it's one of the things that we've both loved about it. We've been in this show together for four and a half years and we've never met in person. How awesome is that? But we're great friends. I, I mean, it's crazy. I know. It's, it's absolutely amazing. We know everything about each other and all about our kids. And, you know, it's just, I, I know it's like having kind of long distance family. It's been great. And we love our show and all the authors and we love who we have on today, don't we? We absolutely do. Now, guys, if you have never, ever, ever, ever met Jennifer Ann Gordon, she wears like a ton of amazing, beautiful hats. She's a multi-award winning dark fiction horror author in addition to everything else that she does. And um, her book, Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, won the Kindle Award for Best Horror Suspense for 2020. And the featured book, the one we're going to be talking about a bit more today, which is pretty ugly, and I'm interested about where that title came from. It won the Helicon Award for Best Horror 2022. Also, her other work is Daylight from Madness, which is the hotel book series, received the gold seal from the Book View and also the platinum seal from Reader's favorite. So without any further ado, let's give a hearty warm welcome to our amazing guest, Jennifer Ann. Hello. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> so glad yeah. to have you on our show. It's yes. good to be here. Um, I will say, so it's morning where I am. It was a freezing morning where I am, mm. much like Mary Elizabeth. So um, I thought, and I, I'm all bundled up in my sweater. I'm hoping my my ring light is going to keep me a little bit warm because I didn't want to turn on the space heater and have it make like this weird clanking noise <laughs> during the interview. Yeah, but you you write horror, so it would have been perfect because we yeah I could have just said with... it's a ghost. Yeah, it's a whole, just right, a, ghost. a whole ghost story, right? I mean, I do live in a haunted house, so it would have been it would have been fine. <laughs> oh, that is so amazing, and and like. Well, okay, I know we have questions for you, but if we have time, we have to ask you about the ghost. Okay, let's dive we, right in. We absolutely yeah. do. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I wanted to give we'll a huge make time. shout out to, um, <laughs> to Aaron uh, and also to Allison, who's joined us there. Great, great to have you in the comments and welcome. Now, Jennifer, you are a woman of a ton of different hats um, and many creative talents. Which is your, of all your creative talents, which is your favorite and how did you segue into becoming a writer? Um, I mean, I think writing actually is my favorite out of all of them. Uh, for people who don't know me, I went to school for theater and I worked in professional regional theater for many years. Uh, I worked as a painter. I'm a multimedia, mixed media artist. Uh, my day job for the past 13 years has been a professional ballroom dance instructor. So basically what I'm saying is I cannot do math and I was really bad at science. So I only can do things that are creative. Uh, but I think I've been writing since I was a kid and it was my first love. And I, I think writing actually encompasses everything that I love. Like I, I feel like as a writer, I'm acting out every amazing part of every amazing movie or play I could ever want to be in. I'm creating characters the same way I would on a stage. I'm painting pictures, this time with words. And uh, if I want to break out into dance or have one of my characters break out into dance in the book, I can do that too. Oh, I love it. I love it. And you know, I was just discussing this this morning, Jennifer, about how brilliant the creative art mind is right but you have people who are so creative that way but they can't take an act or pass it they can't do well in math yeah. but if you give them a test on the creative side they're going to be way off the charts you know yeah well i mean i'm way back in the day when i took my sats i took them multiple times because my math score was abysmal 
every time and my English side was off the charts and I'm like, mm. oh no, <laughs> like, what do you do? Like, what college do you go to? <laughs> or, the creative or, art college is where yeah, you go. I went to a fine arts college. We there didn't even go. have math. <laughs> Not even an option. Yeah, there you go. Well, we want to know, did you consciously choose to become a horror writer? We always love to hear this story because we do, we have interviewed lots of horror um, writers. So was this like your whole life or, you know, did something just happen and attract you to it? Yeah, yeah something traumatic as a child. Um, no, I <laughs> have always loved horror. I've always been drawn to it. Uh, since I was a little, little kid and I walked in on my mother watching the movie Poltergeist. Oh. And, you know, I was just, it was on HBO or something. And I think I might have been three or four and, and I couldn't sleep. So I wandered downstairs and there's my mother watching this, you know, really scary movie. And instead of putting me directly to bed, she let me stay up for a little while. And like, in the movie Poltergeist, there's a little girl in it and terrible things happened to her. And I was petrified because I felt like I was that little girl. And like, that was kind of my first experience of like liking the experience of being scared, if that makes sense. Um, I also read a Stephen King novel, Pet Cemetery, at a very early age, at the age of 10. Uh, it was the cover with the cat on it. Uh, my uncle was living with us at the time. It was his copy of the book. I thought it was a book about a cat, so I snatched it. Um, and like I knew I shouldn't have it, but I still thought it's a it's a book about a cat. It can't be that bad. Um, and I remember reading it in little chunks in my bedroom, hiding behind my dollhouse, and just knowing full well if my parents caught me with it, I would be in so much trouble. And yeah, since then horror has been my go-to comfort my comfort book, if that makes any sense. Like there's nothing more comforting to me than being petrified uh, reading about ghosts or a haunted house. I do write other things besides horror, but uh, primarily what I am known for at this time in my career is uh, a horror novelist, but there, there's more to come. Mm. Yeah. We got to say hi to our buddy, Terry Shepard. Hey, Terry. Hey, Terry. <laughs> And where do you draw your inspiration from? So now we understand where you, you know, where the horror bit comes from. But, you know, your stories are mesmerizing. So where do you draw that inspiration from? Um, you know, I always say that I write, like, sometimes this phrase is like poo-pooed upon where I say like, oh, I write literary horror or I write grief horror or trauma horror. So I always take... Um, for example, in Pretty Ugly, I took the concept of childhood grief and what happens if you lose somebody very important to you during childhood. Who, what does that turn you into? Do you become somebody who cannot accept love or be loved? And then if you are that person, what happens when, and in the case of Pretty Ugly, what happens when the world ends or is coming to an end? who are you during those moments? So I try to, I try to write horror from a very real place, um, more psychological horror than, I don't tend to write about monsters. I'm not saying I never will, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't tend to write about vampires or werewolves or Lovecraftian creatures. I love that, it's not my forte, but I like using horror as a metaphor for a lot of times grief or trauma, because what better thing is, than a ghost to represent something that you may have lost? Oh, you know, that's really very brilliant. And uh, children are very fascinated by that. You know, where does a person go when they die? And then a lot of times kids are tuned into like grandpa or grandma, like grandpa's here right now, mom, you know, I mean, I've had yes. those conversations. So uh, brilliant on you for coming from that angle, you know, uh, to help us be in touch with all that. Okay. So we, we're going to, I want, we want to ask you about your title. Um, pretty ugly and like the way you chose to do it. Cause you don't always see titles like that. You know, you, you just see, you know, maybe you see a hyphen there in, instead of the way that it is. So what made you think about doing it that way? So, you know, my very first, um, 
kind of inspiration for Pretty Ugly came pre-pandemic. Uh, so this was in a time before we got very used to seeing people in face masks. And I, I thought about the world and I thought about our online world and how obsessed people are with image. So I, you know, again, I, I thought of these two characters, a failed politician and an Instagram influencer and why they are the way they are, you know, where their entire life is based on their facade. It's not who they are inside, but it's who they are on the outside is what gives them fulfillment. And then I thought, what if something happened in the world where everybody's faces, I don't want to say started rotting off their body, but what would happen if there was a virus that really attacked you very physically in your face, like predominantly? It could kill you or it could leave you physically scarred to the point of you would have to wear a mask. So I thought of this dichotomy of the facade, the pretty, and the physical ugly, but then it's also a play on words because these people are not the most likable when you first meet them. But through, you know, living through the end of the world and through kind of discovering why they are the way they are, they their real beauty finally starts to shine through. So, you know, started as a play on words. <laughs> And your and your characters, Jennifer, are they all purely fictional? Um, and I'm asking this because a lot of authors will say some, you know, yes, they're 100% fictional. But most of the times we find that authors will say they've um, drawn on people they know in real life and they sort of exaggerate their character a little bit. Um, so how, did you, how do you put your characters together? Where do you draw your inspiration for the characters from? Uh, th this is probably going to make me sound either incredibly narcissistic or incredibly neurotic, maybe both. I feel like all of my characters are my worst qualities rolled into a different kind of package. So, um, and some of my best qualities, because my characters are, they might not be likable, but I think at the end of every book, you do love them. Uh, so... Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the character is me. Like I, my character, my male lead in Pretty Ugly, his name is Sam. His nickname is Sam the Eagle, and I called him that for a number of reasons in the book. But the inspiration for that was when I was very very little. I had a crush on the Sam the Eagle Muppet, <laughs> and I didn't even realize, like a, it was a Muppet and a bird. And I remember my father. Um, just telling me I should not have a crush on this puppet, not because it was a puppet, but he later on told me it was because that puppet was, it symbolized being a Republican. And my, like, <laughs> and my dad was like, that's the wrong choice. When really he should have been like, okay, you're three, you have a crush on a bird. Hopefully you'll grow out of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting how our parents freak out when we're little over something. <laughs> I know, over something that like, obviously at the age of three, I had no idea what any, I didn't even really know what having a crush meant, but I knew that I really liked Sam the Eagle's strong nose line. And frankly, I still like a good strong nose line in a person. <laughs> There you go. It makes a good character. It makes for good character drawing. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it always was a symbol of... Um, stamina and strength and personality and all kinds of stuff, you know, for a long time and in society for, for a very long time. Um, do you have a copy of your book with you? I don't. Um, do. I am. So, you know, we're going to talk about my house. Maybe if we get a chance, um, my husband's <laughs> office is up where all of my books are. And so I am like sequestered in like our, our bottom bedroom. And I, didn't even think to grab one of my books. I can. No, it's okay. It. Let's talk about your house. Let's talk about the ghost then. <laughs> so, um, for people who follow me on Instagram or Facebook, a little over a year ago, I moved to very rural New Hampshire to a, a strange looking Gothic house in the middle of the woods. Uh, when people see it, usually they think it is an old church, it's not. 
It was designed by a woman named Esther. She was a poet and an artist herself. And she bought this land and lived in a little cottage on the property and, you know, and designed this house that I now live in with my husband. And the house doesn't really make sense because she wasn't an architect. She had no de house design skills. And, but she, she had this house built that had everything she needed, which was a, a tower overlooking all of the property where that was her, her writing space in her office. And so it's, it's a really wonderful space to live in. The walls are made of bookshelves. It's really cool. But our second, third and fourth floor are all kind of open concept. So where I write in the fourth floor tower it's also kind of, it overlooks my husband's office. So he's working now near all my books, but so I'm, I'm in our bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. The, you know, yeah, on like the garden the, level the floor. Metal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Esther, Esther is still here. Esther, our, our lovely friendly ghost. I, we can hear her sometimes. She is benevolent and amazing. Uh, mainly, I hear her pacing up in the little writing tower, and I, and I just really understand what she's going through. So, <laughs> was you, like, can, you can channel Esther. her. You can channel yeah. her while you're writing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm always just like I pace up there too. <laughs> <laughs> and if I I do want to ask you about the covers of your book. Like your, your books, the, the the covers of all your books are very very striking do you Thank use you. the same artist and and how much creative input do you have in in your covers so uh my very first novel beautiful frightening and silent the photograph on the cover of that book is uh, a woman in a kind of shredded wedding gown you can't see her face that photo is a photo of me <laughs> That was oh. taken by my husband. We were performing in a haunted attraction and we did a couple, you know, photo shoots on that property in a fake cemetery. Uh, so that actually, I never intended that to be my book cover for Beautiful, Frightening and Silent. I started using it as like a teaser image and then people were really responding to it and saying, I love your book cover. And I kept thinking, that's not my book cover. That's me. <laughs> so I photoshopped my tattoos out and ended up using that photo as the cover for Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent. For my two short novel series, the Hotel series, which includes From Daylight to Madness and When the Sleeping Dead Still Talk, uh, I had a lot of creative control in those. Uh, I sent kind of core images and had long, long, long discussions with one of the most amazing cover designers out there. His name is Don Noble. He works for Rooster Republic Press. It's, it's a company that he owns. He does a lot of horror related covers. So he designed those two and I couldn't love them more. Uh, Pretty Ugly has had two covers already in its, in its short one year life. And they were both designed by the team at Books and Moods. And again, I had a lot of creative control. I picked out uh, the core imagery and let them do their magic for both. Mm, it's like a marriage, a perfect marriage when you can find that somebody can work, you can work with somebody who can see your uh, creative, you know, boiling yeah. up in your mind. And it's it can it's magical. It's yeah, magical it magic. to say words to somebody and just say something like, oh, you know, I like want it to be a Victorian era woman, but also a teacup and also blah and look like a tarot card. And then, you know, Come and on. that's how Don Noble made the magic that is from Daylight to Madness, that cover. Like I got it and I burst into tears. I was just like, oh. It's perfect. It's amazing. Yes. I always love this part when we ask authors, you know, how that sort of creative part of the cover came about and, you know, just how the artist can sort of just somehow get into your head and translate what you envision inside your head onto, yeah, onto it is. your cover. It's really spectacular. And, you know, and Don Noble is a genius and he's so good at making horror covers and he understands the horror community. Uh, and then the people at Books and Moods, they handled the interior design of Pretty Ugly as well uh, for the paperback. 
and they were in charge of the early arcs being sent out and all. so they really had their their finger like inside this book they knew they knew this book almost as well as i knew the book so when it came time for the cover to come out it was just it was easy that is awesome so what would you tell your younger self i would tell her to not stop writing even when you don't believe in yourself and that there is you know no such thing as good or bad during the whole writing process uh there's just writing and you can always take something that's bad and 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 make it something better i think early on i got very discouraged especially in my process of writing Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent. I always say that book took 20 years and two months of actual writing. But the 20 years that I kept telling myself I couldn't write it were, you know, 20 years. I don't want to say wasted because obviously the life I lived enhanced the book, but I would have loved to believed in myself earlier. Mm. Yeah, some very true words for all of us, right? Yes. Absolutely. And are all your books traditionally published, self-published? What's your thoughts for an author out there that's um, an aspiring author? What's your words of wisdom as, as to, you know, going traditionally publishing or self-published? So I love, I love books being out there and I love books in general. So that being said, I am kind of all over the place. Uh, my first book, Beautiful, Frightening and Silent, was traditionally published with a small press. Uh, since then, that small press has gone, you know, the way of the unicorn it is gone. It no longer exists. So now that book is self-published. Uh, the Hotel series and Pretty Ugly are self-published. Uh, and I, Pretty Ugly, I was going to query, but by the time I was done, the, the pandemic was happening. And this was a book that involved sickness and the words pandemic. And I didn't want to... I was like, I just have to put it out now because in by the time it's traditionally published, it'll be three years from now and either it won't feel as intensely personal and important or people will just say, I don't want to read about anything with somebody in a mask. Mm. Uh, so Pretty Ugly came out uh, for that reason. That being said, I do have a literary agent uh, the last year, year and a half of my life, I've been spent, I've spent working on a book that I had pitched to her. That book is currently um, out on submission to publishers right now, uh, very recently. So this happened at the end of last week, beginning of this week. Uh, so it's exciting and nerve wracking. And um, hopefully I'll have some kind of announcement soon about that. But you never know, because Traditional publishing happens at such a different pace than small publishing and certainly self-publishing. So I, I know a lot of people who have been saying, oh, you haven't put out a book in a year and a half. Did you stop writing? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's just I'm on a different timeline. And I think all of them are valid. But I will say in my heart of hearts, I have always wanted a traditional book deal since I was little. I wanted to be able to go to New York City and have lunch with my editor. And, you know, I've wanted all of that. So I have nothing against self-publishing. I intend to probably still continue to self-publish in the future, certain projects, uh, but I'm, I'm reaching for that brass ring and going for hopefully traditionally published sometime in the next couple years because again it takes a long time yeah the submission it process itself takes can take a year yeah well they have up to 18 months and it just depends on the size of the the house you yes. know what they get done but um we are so happy that you joined us today and got to share all mm. this stuff and and we are we're saying uh we're sending you prayers and good wishes that that dream of yours will come true and you'll have to let us know if it does uh, I definitely will. It's always, you know, exciting. I'm, I'm very excited to see when my friends get their book deals and they finally get to make those big fancy announcements of like those publisher marketplace announcements. So, I mean, that's the dream. Hopefully it'll happen. Uh, so stay tuned, but 
that being said, I'm already hard at work on another novel. So I'm sh I'm sure it will happen for you, Jennifer. And uh, we'd love to have you back. Um, you know, as I soon as you've got the day to your next book, do let us know so we can get you booked. So thank you so much for being by on our show today. We really enjoyed the time bro. with you. The time flies when you have fun. So thank you so much for um, for staying with us and to our amazing audience. You'd shout out to every one of you for joining us on the show as well today. And we'll see you back next week on another episode of the Writer's Corner live show. Stay, stay well, everyone, and goodbye for now. Thank you.